Hi students, this is Dr. Joe Angley, and in this lecture we will be learning about nuclear power and hydropower and the effects that they have on the environment. After viewing this material, you should be able to answer the following questions. How do nuclear reactors work? What are some of the advantages and disadvantages of using nuclear power? Where is nuclear power waste from power plants stored in the United States? What is the purpose of the containment structure on a nuclear reactor? What is the status of Lake Mead as a viable power generating facility and water reservoir? And lastly, what are the three environmental consequences of hydroelectric dams? After fossil fuels, nuclear and hydropower are dominant global sources of energy. Both produce electricity in contrast to fossil fuels that can also provide transportation and heating fuel. Both nuclear and hydropower are expensive ventures made possible by billions of dollars in government funding over many years. In 1954, President Eisenhower announced that the United States would build nuclear power electrical generators to provide clean, abundant energy. He predicted that nuclear energy would fill the deficit caused by predicted shortages of oil and natural gas. It would provide power, quote, too cheap to meter, unquote. Today, there are about 440 reactors in use worldwide, 104 of them in the United States. Half of the U.S. plants, that is 52, are over 30 years old and are approaching the end of their expected operational life. Cracking pipes, leaking valves, and other parts increasingly require repair or replacement as a plant ages. Nuclear power now amounts to about 8% of the U.S. energy supply. Rapidly increasing construction costs, safety concerns, and the difficulty of finding permanent storage sites for radioactive waste has made nuclear energy less attractive than promoters expected in the 1950s. Of the 140 reactors on order in 1975, 100 were canceled. Decommissioning a retired plant can be costly. The cost for demolishing a worn-out nuclear power plant may be 10 times as much as building it in the first place. 10 nuclear reactors have been shut down in the United States and deconstruction of most of them is now underway. Although these plants are generally small, costs have averaged several hundred million dollars each. The nuclear power industry has been campaigning for greater acceptance, arguing that reactors don't release greenhouse gases during ordinary operation of the reactor. On the other hand, the mining, processing, and shipping of nuclear fuel together with decommissioning of old reactors and perpetual storage of wastes produces substantial amounts of carbon dioxide emissions and other pollutants. New York's Indian Point Nuclear Power Plant is ranked the riskiest in the country by the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission due to its age and location on the Hudson River just 24 miles north of Manhattan Island. What would it cost to evacuate New York City if these reactors melt down? Here in Florida, Nuclear power plants are located quite near Miami, Florida, and in the vicinity of Tampa, Florida, and Orlando. The most commonly used fuel in nuclear power plants is uranium-235, a naturally occurring radioactive isotope of uranium. Uranium ore must be purified to a concentration of about 3% uranium-235, enough to sustain a chain reaction in most reactors. The uranium is then formed into cylindrical pellets, slightly thicker than a pencil and about 1.5 centimeters long. Although small, these pellets pack an amazing amount of energy. Each 8.5 gram pellet is equivalent to a ton of coal or four barrels of crude oil. The pellets are stacked in hollow metal rods, approximately 4 meters or 13 feet long, and about 100 of these rods are bundled together to make a fuel assembly. Thousands of fuel assemblies containing about 100 tons of uranium are then bundled in a heavy steel vessel called the reactor core. Radioactive uranium atoms are unstable. That is, when struck by a high-energy subatomic, subatomic particle called a neutron, 
they undergo nuclear fission, or splitting, releasing energy and more neutrons. When uranium is packed tightly in the reactor core, the neutrons released by one atom will trigger the fission of another uranium atom and the release of still more neutrons, as shown in this figure. Thus, a self-sustaining chain reaction is set in motion and vast amounts of energy are released. This is a pressurized water nuclear reactor. In this reactor, water is superheated and pressurized as it flows through the reactor core, and heat is transferred to non-pressurized water in the steam generator, which drives the turbine to produce electricity. In most nuclear reactors, water circulates in a primary loop and absorbs heat released by the fuel rods. The water is superheated to 317 degrees, but kept under high pressure, more than 2,000 psi, so that it remains liquid. It is then pumped into a secondary loop where it heats water to produce steam, which spins an electric generating turbine. Note that the primary loop is located within the containment structure designed to contain gases in the event of a nuclear disaster. The secondary loop and power generators are located outside the containment structure as they are not radioactive. Back in the reactor core, the chain reaction is moderated or slowed in a power plant by a neutron absorbing cooling solution that circulates between the fuel rods. In addition, control rods of neutron absorbing material such as cadmium or more likely boron are inserted into spaces between fuel assemblies to shut down the fission reaction or are withdrawn to allow it to proceed. The greatest danger in one of these complex machines is a cooling system failure. If the pumps fail or pipes break during operation, the nuclear fuel quickly overheats and a quote-unquote meltdown can result that releases deadly radioactive material. Although nuclear power plants cannot explode like a nuclear bomb, the radioactive releases from a worst-case disaster, such as the meltdown of the Fukushima reactors in Japan in 2011, can entail enormous costs. Two well-known nuclear disasters are the Chernobyl disaster in northern Ukraine and the Fukushima nuclear accident in Fukushima, Japan. These are the only two nuclear energy accidents classified as a level 7 event, the maximum classification, on the international nuclear event scale. The Chernobyl disaster occurred on 25th to 26th of April in 1986 in the number 4 light water graphite moderated reactor at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant. The event occurred during a late-night safety test, which simulated a station blackout power failure, in the course of which safety systems were intentionally turned off. A combination of the inherent reactor's design flaws and the reactor operators arranging the core in a manner contrary to the checklist for the test eventually resulted in uncontrolled reaction conditions. Water flashed into steam generating a destructive steam explosion and a subsequent heating of the graphite and the nuclear fuel produced updrafts that carried radioactive nuclear fission products across Western USSR and Europe. Note that in this Soviet design, there was no containment structure constructed over the nuclear materials. The Fukushima Daiichi nuclear disaster was an accident uh, at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant in Okumu, Fukushima Prefecture, initiated primarily by the tsunami following an earthquake on 11 March 2011. Immediately after the earthquake, the active reactors automatically shut down their sustained fission reactions. The earthquake triggered a 13 to 15 meter or 43 to 49 foot high tsunami that arrived, arrived approximately 50 minutes later. The waves overtopped the plant's 19-foot seawall, flooding the basement of the power plant's turbine uh, buildings and disabling the emergency diesel generators. The earthquake also knocked out power lines, which could have provided an alternate source of power. So without power, the cooling water pumps uh, didn't operate, and the lack of cooling led to three nuclear meltdowns hydrogen air explosions, and the release of radioactive materials in Units 1, 2, and 3 from the 12th of March to the 15th of March. 
Loss of cooling also raised concerns over the recently loaded spent fuel pool of Reactor 4, which increased in temperature on 15 March due to decay heat from the freshly added spent fuel rods, but did not boil down to exposure. There are no clear plans for decommissioning this plant, but the plant management estimates 30 to 40 years. A frozen soil barrier has been constructed in an attempt to prevent further contamination of seeping groundwater. But in July 2016, it was revealed that the ice wall had failed to totally stop groundwater from flowing in and mixing with highly radioactive water inside the wrecked reactor buildings and adding that they're technically incapable of blocking the groundwater with the frozen wall. Unfortunately, this water then, then uh, leaks, leaches into the uh, Pacific Ocean. One of the most difficult problems associated with nuclear power is the disposal of wastes produced during mining, fuel production, and reactor operation. Enormous piles of mine waste and abandoned mill tailings in uranium-producing countries represent serious waste disposal problems. Production of 1,000 tons of uranium fuel typically generates 100,000 tons of tailings and 3.5 million liters of liquid waste. These are now, um, there, sorry, there are now approximately 200 million tons of radioactive waste in piles around mines and processing plants in the United States alone. This material is carried by the wind or washes into streams, contaminating areas far from its original source. In addition to the leftovers from fuel production, the United States has about 77,000 tons of high level, that is very reactive, waste. The high level waste consists mainly of spent fuel rods from commercial nuclear power plants and assorted wastes from nuclear weapons production. While they're still intensely radioactive, spent fuel assemblies are being stored in deep water-filled pools at the power plants. These pools were originally intended only as temporary storage until the wastes were shipped to reprocessing centers or permanent disposal sites. Dry cask storage, shown in this photo, is a method of storing high-level radioactive wastes, such as spent nuclear fuel that has already been cooled in the spent fuel pool for at least one year and often as many as 10 years. Casks are typically steel cylinders that are either welded or bolted closed, and the fuel rods inside are surrounded by inert gas. Ideally, the steel cylinder provides leak-tight containment of the spent fuel. Each cylinder is surrounded by additional steel, concrete, or other materials to provide radiation shielding to workers and members of the public. Storage of nuclear waste in the United States remains a vexing problem. The Yucca Mountain Nuclear Waste Repository was des designated by the Nuclear Waste Policy Act amendments in 1987 to be a deep geological repository storage facility within Yucca Mountain, Nevada for spent nuclear fuel and other high-level radioactive wastes for the United States. The site is located on federal land adjacent to the Nevada test site in Nye County, Nevada, about 80 miles northwest of, of Las Vegas Valley. The project was approved up in 2002 by the Congress, but federal funding for the site ended in 2011 under the Obama administration. There remains an urgent need for some type of long-term nuclear waste storage in the United States. Water power was our first industrial power source. Most early American settlements were built where falling water could drive grist mills and sawmills. The advantage of, of water turbines in the 19th century greatly increased the efficiency of electricity producing hydropower dams. By 1925, falling water generated 40% of the world's electric power. Since then, hydroelectric production capacity has grown 15-fold but fossil fuel use has risen much faster, so water power is now only one quarter of total electric generation. Still, many countries produce most of their electricity from falling water. Norway, for instance, depends on hydropower for 99% of its electricity. Brazil, New Zealand, and Switzerland all produce at least three quarters of their electricity with water power. Canada is the world's leading producer of hydroelectricity running 400 power stations with a combined capacity exceeding 60,000 megawatts. 
First Nations people protest, however, that their rivers are being diverted and lands flooded to generate electricity, most of which is sold to, guess who, the United States. Much of the hydropower development since the 1930s has focused on enormous dams. Small dams are common and can produce electricity with relatively modest environmental impacts, but there is an efficiency of scale in giant dams, and they bring prestige to the countries that build them. They also have important social and environmental impacts. China's Three Gorges Dam on the Yangtze River, for instance, is the largest in the world. It spans two kilometers or 1.2 miles and is 187 meters or 600 feet tall. The reservoir it creates has displaced more than 1 million people and drowned important farmlands. In arid regions, hydropower generators can be vulnerable to low water levels. Lake Mead on the Colorado River produces power and water to Las Vegas, Nevada, and other desert cities. The largest reservoir in the United States, Lake Mead, was created when the Hoover Dam was completed in 1935. Since then, water levels have fluctuated dramatically as river flow into Lake Mead has varied. In recent years of drought, engineers have worried that there could be insufficient water to drive the power turbines in the dam. In 2014, the reservoir was at least 40% capacity and water levels were at record lows. If recent droughts continue, the dam could cease producing electricity by 2020, and Las Vegas will need to find alternative sources of both power and water if drought continues as the climate warms. Very large dams, such as China's Three Gorges Dam shown here, produce abundant electricity but have tremendous environmental and social costs. Water loss from evaporation is an important concern in dry climates. Lake Mead's evaporative losses are estimated at nearly 1 billion cubic meters per year. Even worse is Lake Nasser, created on Egypt's Nile River by the Aswan High Dam. This reservoir loses 15 billion cubic meters each year to evaporation and seepage. Unlined canals lose another 1.5 billion cubic meters. Together, these losses represent one half of the Nile's flow and enough water to irrigate 2 million hectares of land. The silt trapped by the Aswan High Dam formerly fertilized farmland during seasonal flooding and provided nutrients that supported a rich fishery in the Delta region. Now farmers must buy expensive chemical fertilizers and the fish catches have dropped almost to zero. Large dams also destroy biodiversity. Brazil's controversial Belo Monte Dam on the Zingu River, a major tributary of the Amazon, finished in 21, uh, 2015, is the third largest in the world. Designed to fuel mining and development in this remote region, it will flood 250 square kilometers or 96 uh, square miles of tropical rainforest. Indigenous Kaiopo people have protested that the dam is destroying traditional hunting lands and will eliminate many endemic species. A more global concern is methane emissions. As in all tropical dams, submerged vegetation in the drowned forest will emit methane as it decays. This methane could have a greater global warming impact than burning coal to produce an equivalent amount of electricity. Despite these concerns, large dams are an important energy source. They produce energy at a scale that electric utilities can manage and sell for large consumers, including mining, industry, and large cities. Public subsidies are necessary to build these dams, but over the long term, the price of electricity is much lower than that from nuclear and many other sources. Recent studies have also shown that the anoxic conditions that give rise to methane formation can also lead to the generation of methyl mercury. When coal is burned, it releases mercury to the atmosphere. Mercury is deposited on land and water surfaces and can accumulate in dams. Mercury is converted to methyl mercury by anaerobic bacteria deep in the, under the surface of the water and can then be available to the aquatic food web. Native Americans in Canada who rely on fishing have recently been found to suffer from mercury poisoning from mercury produced in hydroelectric dams.